Join us on a journey through time and space where we explore alternative perspectives on some of the world's most mysterious topics. I'm your host, Dr. Rita Louise, and thank you all for joining us today. In the New Testament, we are told that on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead. In the act of res- is the act of resurrection exclusive to Jesus, the Son of God, or are books like the Egyptian Book of the Dead offering us insights into this long-forgotten mystery? With that, is our interpretation of a literal resurrection of the dead correct, or were our ancestors instead discussing a life-altering spiritual awakening that has been misconstrued for centuries? To help us unravel this novel or mystery, we're going to be speaking to Freddie Silva about his new book, The Lost Art of Resurrection. Freddie Silva is a best-selling author and leading researcher of alternative history ancient knowledge, sacred sites, and the interaction between temples and consciousness. He is also the world's leading expert on crop circles. So please welcome to the show, Freddie Silva. Hey, Freddie, how's it going? Hello, Rita. How are you doing? It's doing great. I'm so excited to have you on. Um, But let's start here. Um, It's your first time on the show. So maybe tell us a little bit about about you and what got you interested in ancient mysteries and alternative history in the first place? It's quite simple. I was uh, drawing pyramids when I was three years of age. So uh, I think that uh, I was hardwired to sort of get into this subject at one point or another, uh, having taken a small detour into the world of commerce. And then uh, it sort of finds you. It's kind of like a long lost love. Uh, It's sort of comes back like a boomerang and finds you again. So it's uh, it's kind of interesting because it, it sort of helps you to question preconceived thoughts or even ideas that we've been told are, are, are like this. But it turns out when you actually look at some of our most cherished ideas, um, the evidence doesn't really hold up. So if I'm going to follow something, uh, particularly a religious concept, then I want to be following it for the right reasons. Mm-hmm. It just seems that people that work in the, I'm going to say alternative thought, and I'm using that in a very big way, (laughs) um, seem to be kind of geeky when they're kids. You know, I I remember for myself, I started reading books on archaeology and the theory of evolution in like sixth or seventh grade and have always read nonfiction historical kinds of books. And it sounds like you were kind of the same way, just on this quest for information and knowledge. Yeah, I was, I was really into uh, fantasy, actually, uh, more than anything else. Uh, when I was growing up in the in the 70s, uh, which is giving away my age now, um, I was really into sort of fantasy art and things like that. I just, the modern world just didn't seem to have much of an appeal because so much of it just didn't make sense. And now I know why, because, uh, you know, truth has a ring to it. And when you fed and spoon fed so much information that you just don't find an appeal for, is you a good sign that there's something not true about it? Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's, I think, is what spurs you on to inquire and go and do things. So, yeah, all those uh, sort of years spent looking at uh, books, which most people throw away, uh, actually has <laughs> really paid off, you know, because you now you see the world through very different, um, exactly. through eyes which are closer to the truth, actually. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Well, let's turn our attention to your new book, uh, The Lost Art of Resurrection, which delves into the concept of resurrection. And as I said in the introduction, when I think of resurrection, I can't help but think of Jesus resurrecting from the dead. Is the concept of resurrection found outside of Christian theology? Oh God, yes. Uh, In fact, it was a huge eye-opener and it really began when I was researching my previous book on the Knights Templar. They kept talking about an inner brotherhood of people who were declared risen uh, and the people who were outside the group were declared dead. And I thought, that's a very weird sort of metaphor. What are they talking about? 
And uh, when I did my research on ancient sacred sites and uh, a lot of the mystery schools that were associated with these places around the world, uh, it turns out that they had the same concept. And you have this idea in 2800 BC in China of the gentleman of the way uh, who used to go on pilgrimages to sacred mountains to find themselves, to find a doorway into the other world. And when they came back, they were declared risen from the dead. And I suddenly began to realize, wait a minute, we're talking about a 2,800-year gap between the story of uh, how Christianity evolved compared to how these old practices around the world were playing out. It turns out that the concept was not unique to Jesus. In fact, it turns out that he was just following a very, very long tradition of initiation around the world, which actually makes him a much more interesting person, in my opinion. Uh, What happened was is that the church took the idea uh, of, uh, in fact, took several ideas. In fact, let's just be honest about it. They ripped off several ideas from other people (laughs) and other religions, and they basically glued them all together, stripped away the foundation, and then applied this uh, this, uh, God-man Jesus and put him as a central figure and then changed the whole dialogue in order to create a a bogus religion. And that's even what uh, the apostles Thomas and Philip actually said in their banned gospels. I had no idea there were even were banned gospels at the time. But the uh, one of the central people, Philip, actually talks about how the church is an impersonation, an imposter of the real church. So when these people start talking about uh, you know, the, the church in this particular way, it makes you question the truth and the validity of the facts. And if you start looking and digging around, it turns out that the story of resurrection is a lot, lot older and practiced by, you know, virtually every society around the world, including North America. Uh, the native cultures of North America did the same ritual. Persia was doing the same ritual, China, Japan. Um, and so we have here a much bigger story and also one that's much more self-empowering. And the best thing is no one ever got crucified and no one ever died uh, in order to be resurrected, which is a huge eye-opener. Well, except in the Jesus story. Except in the Jesus story. In fact, it's funny that uh, the the world's biggest religion is based on fear and violence, which doesn't sound to me like a very good basis for a religion. Um, but if you look back at the um, the overlap between early Christianity and um, Egyptian mysticism, Mm -hmm. uh, you find a lot of parallels here. For example, there was a couple of chambers that were found recently in Egypt, and uh, these were under uh, lesser-known pyramids. Uh, There were supposed to be burial chambers, but no one's ever buried in them, uh, which makes you ask uh, the question, well, why would the pharaoh build the pyramid and the chamber and then get buried somewhere else? It doesn't add up. And uh, there's a couple of Danish scientists who recently looked at the inscriptions that were written on these walls. I mean, they're beautiful texts covering every inch of the walls, uh, particularly at Saqqara. And there's also one particular uh, anomalous tomb in the Valley of the Kings. And they were amazed to find that these texts, which are basically the foundation of the book of coming forth by light, uh, or as uh, has been badly translated as the Book of the Dead, uh, which has nothing to do with the dead whatsoever. Uh, and uh, the Book of Coming Forth by Light, which is part of the pyramid texts, actually talks about the pharaoh or the initiate crossing over into the other world, talking to the uh, the gods, talking to this kind of people, coming back into the living body and expected to go back to his duties after this uh, out-of-body experience. So what they're describing, in essence, is a sort of a near-death experience, a guided near-death experience, where the soul disengages from the body for several days in these special rooms, and then comes back fully aware of where they've been, what they've done, who they've talked to, and that was part of the highest level of initiation, and it was called the living resurrection. Uh, So even in 2600 BC in Egypt, we had this concept of people crossing over having a near-death experience, which sounds very harrowing to me, uh, but coming back and living extraordinary lives. So obviously the experience was very self-empowering. Oh, so many questions. Um. (laughs) It does. It really makes you, it it opens up the conversation in a whole new area and it makes it much more interesting. And the idea is not that I'm trying to take down Jesus. I think it makes Jesus a much more interesting person. It puts Mm -hmm. him into context in a historical context that he was following a very old tradition, which of course he was. 
the idea is to sort of make the point that the church has totally changed the, re the rhetoric around the story in order to create a false religion, uh, which I think is really, really uh, wrong. So the idea is to reclaim this concept of resurrection because it's actually that was meant to be very self-empowering. And people like Plato, Pythagoras, Zoroaster, uh, luminaries throughout history all went through this initiation and they said it was the highest level of spiritual development anyone could expect to experience in their lifetime, but while still alive. Well, and what I find interesting is I relate a very strong parallel between the Egyptian Book of the Dead and, and if I'm not mistaken, it's the Pope of Ul, which is Aztec, and because they both seem like, and bringing it into current times, like a walkthrough to make it through these obstacles and overcome these challenges so that they can get to the underworld and interact with the gods. I mean, to me, they are direct parallels of talking about the same journey. Uh, yeah, and I mean, the uh, the more I travel around the world and look at different cultures, and if I was just in the Yucatan last year, uh, we're talking about the Popol Vuh, and how the Maya also came from a very old tradition that's, uh, that even remembers the big flood, which is in 9700 BC. That's quite a memory. And all of these um, books, even the Tibetan Book of the Dead, uh, and when you start looking at the, uh, the difference, methods of, um, I won't say religion, I won't say faith, uh, religion gets into a very slippery slope of organized dogma. Um, these books of faith all really do talk about the same thing when you strip them down. I mean, for example, the Egyptian, uh, there's an Egyptian um, book that talks about the uh, uh, challenges of the Pharaoh. And uh, there are 39 uh, different phrases that the Pharaoh would get up and uh, read every morning to himself or herself. Uh, in fact, any initiate would do this in preparation for their daily life. And you start reading them, they actually turn out to be uh, the later version of the uh, Ten Commandments, except 29 have been cautiously removed. <laughs> <laughs> I guess they didn't have much of a, a sort of a attention span even back then. Um, so we, we do have a lot of overlaps. And, the, and the, when you strip everything away and, the, and all the symbolism and the, uh, uh, the different uh, visualization that each of these books gives you, it's quite clear that they're all very fundamentally trying to get you to be aware that you are a soul inside a body. And it's difficult down here. And the one of the methods that they found, and I don't know how they did this, but one of the methods that they found of being able to empower yourself to live your life aware and awake uh, is to basically leave the body. So it's a bit of a paradox that you're here on earth, your soul is trapped in a body, and yet the idea is that you get out of your body for a little bit, find out how the universe really works, how the mechanics of, the, of nature really work, and then you come back into the body totally cognizant of, of this information and you apply it in your daily life. So it's nothing more difficult than that, although it obviously requires a lot of effort to understand this in the first place and bring it to the public forum. So they're all basically talking about a way in which you can basically empower yourself, uh, remember who you are, uh, or as the Greeks uh, uh, said it in their mystery schools, know yourself. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and if you know yourself, then no, nobody can really tell you what to do. And nobody can tell you what's right and wrong. You basically figure out life in, in your own terms. And uh, that, of course, is the, the one way that you lead the path to your own salvation, as it were. It seems like when you explore some of the, some very, and I'm going to say indigenous cultures um, that still have a method of, chanting and dance and that kind of uh, ecstatic ritual yeah. that they use that that format in order to i'm going to say commune with god to leave their body to channel spirit whatever um what i have found is that as we became more civilized we we let <laughs> that part go and it seems like in listening to you, this was a method of them attaining that ecstatic state without, you know, dancing around a fire and chanting and doing that kind of thing. 
Yeah, and in fact, I wanted to find out what the connection to shamanism was when I was researching this project, and that there was a distinct difference. There, there are um, similarities to shamanism. For example, the current trend to go after the Amazon and drink ayahuasca, uh, which from uh, the people that have done it, uh, doesn't sound very, very nice, actually. <laughs> uh, I get the same effect and the same visions by basically going hanging out with large upright rocks in, sta in uh, stone circles and things like that. Um, but it really was about uh, uh, finding a method, a tool, where you disengage from the body. And uh, it appears to have taken many, many years to perfect. Um, for one thing, it's, uh, they were trying to achieve a near-death experience. And as anyone has been through that today, uh, even doctors uh, and people in hospitals know, uh, it's a bit of a harrowing experience. I mean, your soul suddenly finds itself looking down upon its, its body. It's disengaged. It's meeting all kinds of discarded things. It has no idea where it's going. And it's, you know, it can be a little bit perplexing. It's like being stuck uh, you know, in a dark alley in the middle of uh, a bad part of Detroit. Uh, and uh, you know, on a Saturday night, <laughs> <laughs> and I mean a really bad part of Detroit, uh, you just don't know where you are, and you kind of feel a little bit apprehensive. So, what I was reading from the surviving extracts about the journey to the other world was that they actually spent about three years learning the methods to still the emotions. You had to have control of the emotions before you undertook this journey, because what you take with you. Uh, basically colors the experience. So if you go into the other side with fear, uh, you're going to basically uh, draw that to you. You don't want that. So but don't you, people, I don't mean to interject, sure. but don't people also have that kind of experience if they have a near-death experience where some, it's bad, some people see Jesus, some, you know, their experiences yeah. are very different, but okay. it's more based on their belief system and where they are. Exactly. So you're taking something with you, uh, some preconception notion with you on to, into the other world and it helps to color the direction of your experience. And one of the mystery schools were very keen on was to remove all that. Uh, they wanted to basically deflesh you, uh, metaphorically speaking, as much as possible. So you basically cross over as a pure spirit. No emotion, no attachment, just a pure uh, method of crossing from one level into another and also being very cognizant of what you're going to see when you get there. So they were very adamant about the instructions and the Egyptians wrote about the instructions in very careful little terms in these false tombs because no one was buried there. The box was used as for an out-of-body experience. So you'd learn what to look for as your soul is traveling. So you're totally aware at every single moment you have complete control. Now with shamanism, you have something that's very similar, but to a certain degree, you are out of control. Uh, unless you've been doing it for a long, long time and you are an adept, and you know how to maintain control. But most of the time, it's just a shortcut to leave the body and connect with this uh, other world. And you come back and you go, wow, that was interesting. But you don't necessarily have come back with the tools or the knowledge or the information which makes the other world journey so much more interesting. Because that, that was the whole point. It wasn't just a, a ride somewhere else uh, just to get away from this you know, very painful world for a few minutes. It was actually a method to come back in a way that made you a better person. Uh, and that really was the big difference. That's why they spent years perfecting this before they were even allowed to go anywhere near the secret chamber. Uh, because by then, they would have had the total practice of what they were doing and where they were going. As a reminder, if you're enjoying today's programming and want to hear more from Freddie and our other amazing guests, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or visit JustEnergyRadio.com to gain access to our over nine years of show archives. Thank mm -hmm. you.